open your Bibles this morning to the book of Colossians. We're going to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, this week as I was praying and seeking God and, and uh, just writing, um, it, the Lord just really dropped this into my heart. This message I'm going to share with you this morning. And I, I really believe it, it should be life changing if we believe the book. See, it all depends upon if we believe the book. If you don't believe the book, then it can't really help you. You got to believe the book. And you got to believe that it is divinely inspired of God, sent by the Spirit of God, given to us. The Word of God is given to us in order to bring us into oneness with God. That's what the book's given for, to transform us, change us. Yes, heal us. He sent his word and he healed them. Uh, to reveal to us the areas of our life that are not in agreement with him. If two be not in agreement together, they can't walk together. And so this book is given to us to bring us into agreement with God. Really, that's what faith is. Faith is when in your heart of hearts, you see it the way that God sees it. That's what faith is. Faith is when you see it the way that God sees it. Um, you know, we, we, and, and there's really no reason why we should have a lack of faith or understanding in, in the day and age that we live. Because we have the word of God so available to us. You know, not just the printing page, but the audio uh, the, the, in our phones. How many got an app on your phone where you can listen to the Bible or read your Bible? Yeah, a lot of people now, a lot of preachers are using either, uh, you know, they're using some kind of electronic device to preach. You know, I still like the, 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 the written word. There's nothing wrong with that. My kids, they all preach off of pad, iPads and whatever they have, you know. But the word of God is powerful and, and, and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So look what Paul said here in first Colossians chapter one, verse 25, wherefore I am made, Paul says, wherefore I am made a minister in Colossians chapter one, verse 25, wherefore, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, we know that Paul had tremendous revelation. He had tremendous insight. Tremendous visitations and encounters. He had tremendous miracles and healings. And yet he says later on in the book of Philippians, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended for. He was saying, uh, listen, I, I don't have, I have not yet experienced all that God has for me. And I think about my own life. I mean, how much have I really experienced what God has for me. Now, you need to understand as we look at this this morning, God is not holding back from you what he has available. Matter of fact, God has already given it all to you. you. You've already been blessed. I believe this book, Paul said, you've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All that God has is already yours. You ought to be grabbing it. But there's something that has to happen for us to get it from that realm into this realm. And, and I've tasted very little bit of it. Now, I'm not talking about getting born again or being saved. I'm talking about after you're born again, after you're saved. How many know that after your mother gave birth to you, that was just the beginning of your adventure? <laughs> I mean, you know, and so getting born again, that's, 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 hey, that's, Absolutely necessary, because unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. But he says, whereof, and he had a revelation. He said, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of the grace of God given to me for you. For in other words, he, he, uh, dispensation means a time period. You're, you have a dispensation in this earth. You have a time period. I, I don't know why. When I first got born again, I literally, it was in my mind, but it was almost like an open vision. I saw an hourglass, and I saw the sand running down through the neck of that hourglass, and I was up in Alaska. And at that time, when I got born again, it was so amazing, so va fabulous, so awesome. I said to myself, I said, well, I've got to go where nobody else has this because this is so good, there's not going to be no room for me down in the lower 48. 
And that's how I ended up living with the Yupik Indians. I said, I'm going to go where they've never heard the gospel before because I, if, when I go down to the lower 48s, it's probably everywhere. This message is so life-changing, so powerful. And then when they got to the lower 48s, I discovered that it was just as much wilderness down here as it was up in Alaska. Especially when it comes to the fullness of what God has done for us. What God has done for us. He says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to you to fulfill the word of God. We're here to fulfill the word of God. Say that I'm here to fulfill the word of God. What, what, that's what Jesus came. If you, if you look Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over and over, it repeats this. It says, and this was done to fulfill the prophet, or this was done to fulfill the word. Everything Jesus did was in order to fulfill the prophetic words that had been sent into the earth before he ever came. Even the virgin birth. Everything, everything. And so I'm here to fulfill God's word, or let's say it this way, God's will for my life. God has a will for my life. Well, I don't know what God's will is for my life. You haven't been reading your Bible. I'm not talking about whether you're called to be an electrician, a plumber, or, you know, or to do this. or to do, I'm talking the natural aspects. I'm talking about who you are as a person. I'm here to fulfill the word of God for Mike Yeager's life. He knew before the foundation of the world that we would all be here right now. Now, one thing you need to understand is that Jesus came to the earth, and yes, he came that all men might be saved. But actually, to be very specific, Jesus came looking for those who would want to know him. Who'd want to follow him? That, that's who he came for. He came for those who, in their heart of hearts, said, I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's what he, how he gathered his apostles and his disciples. He would just preach the gospel, do miracles, and he would say, follow me. And there was many that wouldn't follow him. You know, he, he had disciples that followed him for a while, but then he was going to take them into the reality of really what it's all about. And, and he said this in John 6, Verily, verily, I send to you, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they, they stumbled at that. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. There was a spiritual thing involved in this. And, and then he repeated himself, and he says that, that the majority of his disciples from that moment forward no longer followed him. Because they, they had preconceived ideals of what, it, what life really means. And see, we're, we're all raised, even those of us, and I wasn't, but if you were raised in a Christian family, a lot of times we're wrong with preconceived ideals of what life is really all about and what, what we're here for. And, we're, we're gonna, and Paul had this revelation of why we are here. He said, I came to preach unto you to fulfill the word of God. Next, look at in verse 26. Even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, even a mystery which has been hid. It's, been, it's a hidden reality. It's, it's been hidden. You know, like the, the, like the uh, pearl of great price or the treasure hidden in the field. This is a mystery that has been hidden from the ages. Listen, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now, I, I want you to notice because it's, it's, it, when, when you read the scriptures, you got to understand it's very specific. It's, it, it's not like shooting a, a shotgun with bird, with bird shot. Y'all, y'all, you guys know what it, girls, you know, how many girls know what I mean when I talk about bird shot? Okay, uh, in, in a, in, in a uh, shotgun, you can get what we call a deer slug, and that's like a bullet. But you can also get what we call bird shot, and that means there's a lot of little pellets. So if I would shoot the back wall with, with a, a, a slug, I'd make one hole I'm aiming for. But with a shotgun, you just pull the trigger, and it would scatter, and, and, and you can't miss your target, okay? But the word of God is like that of a rifle, very precise, every word, everything. When, when God told Adam and Eve, now Adam and Eve, he said, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat of it, you're dead. Guess what? He was very specific, and he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And this is where people are making a big mistake in the body of Christ today. They, they're taking the word of God, and they're adding things to it. Uh, I was just had a woman who called me the other day, and, and she was under the misconception 
uh, that all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And I, I said, well, that can't be true because uh, this was dealt with very specifically, especially in 1 John. If you confess your sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, if what these guys are saying, which they've only been propagating this foolishness for the last 15 years, you wouldn't need 1 John 1, 9. No, no, you got to repent of your sins, believer. When you get out of the will of God, you got to repent. Your sins, it's not a license to commit sin and do what you want. But we're headed here for, but, but there's something, the reason why all of these, and, we're, and it tells us in our last days, that there's going to be a lot of false doctrines, lots of it. Why? Because the devil is trying to stop us from partaking of what God really has for us. And all of these lies are designed to keep you from being who God made you to be. Okay? And so he says this, Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Saints. Saint is one who's separated, sanctified, and set apart. So he's specifically talking to people who in their heart of hearts have set their lives aside for God. Now, I'm not saying you got to be a priest or a nun or you got, you got to be a minister per se. Now, we all are ministers of reconciliation, but, but no, no, somebody who has set their heart on God, that's a saint. I'm here for you, Jesus. My life is all about you. Remember, it says that in Colossians, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. When Christ, he's talking to people who are saying, Christ is my life. And, and, and that's, just a, that's just a decision away. It, it's, a, it's a daily choice. You know, Paul said, I die daily. And you say, well, what? it's hard to do that, Pastor Mike. Oh, I, I totally understand. I've got flesh and blood. I live in a world like you do, and especially with the technology we have today. And it's so easy for us to get distracted. But notice what it says here. It says, to whom God would make known. Now, he's going to make it known to the saints. Or he's going to make it to know, known to those who really are serious in their Christianity. Listen to this. You say, I just don't understand why people don't understand because they're not serious. You know, it's like almost any sport or hobby or industry in the world. You know, I love my wife and the ladies, but they sit and they talk about knitting and sewing and, you know, doing this and that. And it goes in one ear and out another, except I got to pay the bill. That's the only thing I really... And, and I try to humor my wife. I love her. I go into her sewing room and, lay, and she'll show me her long arm and she'll show me this and she'll show me that. And I'm just thinking what, what I paid for that thing. And, and, and you know what, though? She's really into it. And they, when Gary and, and, and I go somewhere with Kathy and his wife, Wanda, like we went to a minister's conference some years ago. They're, they're talking shop talk all the way. Me and Gary, we're looking at one another and saying, they're talking another language. We have no idea. Now, I'm sure if we got to talking about fishing and hunting and the things we've been involved in, you know, they would say, what in the world are those guys talking about? But listen, it's only for those who really want to know. Christianity, when it gets down to it, is only for really those who want to know God. They want to know God. They want to know the, the author of creation. You know, the rest of them, they embrace evolution they embrace secularism. They embrace, you know, the intelligence of the mind. Whole another story. Let's look what it says here. To whom God would make known what is, what is the riches of the glory. Say the riches of the glory. Like I said, I, I'm just, there's hundreds of scriptures dealing with this subject. The riches of the glory of this mystery. Say it's a mystery. Among the Gentiles. Now he sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews. Which is, now here's, here it is, are you ready? I'm glad you're sitting down. Here's the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you. Christ in you. Jesus Christ. Here's, here, here, here it is. Here, here's the thunder and the lightning. Here's the trumpet sound. Christ is in you. 
Jesus Christ is in you. Huh. I was meditating on that this week, and I'll tell you what, I was like, like waves of glory was saying, wait, Jesus Christ is in me. Now, when we talk about Jesus Christ in us, we're going to, first of all, ask, how much of Jesus is in you? All of him. All of Jesus is in you. He's in you right now. What part of your existence is he not in? He's in your spirit. He's in your soul. He's in your bones. He's in your blood. He's in you. Jesus is in you. I remember back when we were putting up this building, I was in my office here in McKnightstown in my house. I had an office. I'm, I'm not lying. I don't exaggerate. I'm just praying. I'm talking to the Lord. And the wall, looking towards Gettysburg, my, there was no window there. It was only about maybe three, four feet away. And to my absolute, complete shock and amazement, Jesus walked through my wall. No, I mean, I seen him. It blew me away because I'm just praying. I'm like this, you know, and Jesus walks through my wall. It wasn't my imagination. I go, what? but he didn't stop. In just less than a count of two, he stepped right up to me and pushed himself into my body. I mean, I felt him like a sponge drinks water. He went, he sucked right up into my body. I go, whoa, what is going on? I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'll use the word freaking out. And then I felt him turn around inside of me. And I felt him put his hands where my hands were, his head where my head was, his feet where my feet. And a minute he was in me. Y'all ever see the old Jolly Green Giant commercial? My body grew over 100 feet tall. Now listen, I'm experiencing this. This ain't my imagination. You know, I'm up out of the roof of my house and I'm looking down on the world. And I am so full of power, so full of glory, so full of, of God that I, 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 just, I can't explain it. And, and I'm, I'm going, whoa. And then I was back in my office and he was gone. Out of my body, you might say. But he's in my body. Jesus Christ is in my body. Jesus is in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. You know, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So after this experience, right away, I heard, it was almost the audible voice of God, and he said this to me. He said, go tell my children who they are, for they know not who they are. Or let me say it this way. We don't realize who lives in us. And that only comes by faith. He, dwell, he lives in us by faith. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians. He dwells in us by, how did he first come into you? By faith. If you believe in your heart, he came into you by faith. He lives in you. He moves in you. He functions in you. He flows through you by faith. Faith, out of your belly will flow because Christ lives in you. Christ is in you right now. And, and you might say, well, I, I, don't, I don't feel him. You don't understand, this thing don't work by feelings. This thing don't work by emotions. This thing don't work by intellect. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean on to your understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct thy steps. He, he, he's in you whether you feel, if you're born again, Jesus lives in you. He's in you right now. It kind of reminds me of a neighbor lady in McQuanago, Wisconsin. My vehicle was broke down one day and she had a big old Galaxy 500. How many remember the old Galaxy 500s? She drove that thing so slow that I hated getting behind her. So I said to her one day, I said, I'm so sorry, and they were a good neighbor, and I said, is there any way I've got to go downtown, my car's broke, uh, or I didn't have a vehicle, I said, can I use your, your vehicle? She said, yeah. So I, I took the keys, and I was not enthused about it. 
It was just a dog of a car. It was a lemon of a car. I got in that big old boat of a car. I turned the key, started it, and I pressed the gas a little bit, and the whole car shook. I thought, what in the world? I thought, no way. And I put it in reverse. I thought, well, I'll pump a little bit of gas, and my tire started spinning. I mean, I'm sorry to tell you I did. I shouldn't have done it. I took it out on the highway. I put the pedal to the metal, and it pinned me to the back of that chair because it had a big old engine in it with a four barrel. And I mean, that, that, that car scared me. But she drove that car like it was a lemon. Huh? I, I, here we are. We've got the King of kings and the Lord of lords in us. So Jesus lives in us. Now, what Jesus lives in us? Now, just hold on here for a moment. What do, you mean, what do, you, do we have the baby Jesus? Don't, don't respond with your smart aleck answers. Do we have the baby Jesus living in us? Do we have the young boy Jesus living in us? Do we have the teenager? Do we have even the Jesus who went about doing miracles living in us? Do we have the crucified Jesus living in us? Listen. You've got the resurrected Lord living in you. You've got the Jesus who overcame principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. You've got the glorified Jesus living in you. But we're not Jesus conscious. What do I mean by Jesus conscious? Well, let me give you an illustration. Um, if I was to come and visit your house, right, knock on your door, and I say, I just came to, uh, to visit you for a little bit, would your lifestyle change at all? What you watch, what you say, what you do, would your lifestyle change at all? If, if the physical Jesus, because that's Mike Yeager, but if the physical Jesus was to come to your house and you know it was the physical Jesus, how would you, would you treat your loved ones any differently? Maybe lower your voice. Maybe it'd be, be a little bit nicer, a little bit sweeter, a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more understanding. Now, you know, we, we, we I told you last week, we, we're three personalities. You know, we are who people think we are. We are who we think we are. And we are who God knows we are. But I think there's more personalities than that. <laughs> I think we are who we are when nobody's around. And we are someone else when pastor visits. Hurry up, turn, turn the channel. Turn that off. Stop acting like that. But you understand that Jesus, he's with us and in us 24 hours a day. Amen. He's in us right now. He, 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 he's in me. He's in every fiber of my being, but it's only activated by faith. Does that make sense to you? You know, I got to think, well, how in the world, you know, I got a bottle of water up here and thank God for water because we're made up of over um, pretty close to 90% water. And then I got to thinking, okay, if I took all the water of the world, now how many know God can do anything? He can't lie, of course, and he can't break his word and he, he, he doesn't, no shadow turning. But I'm talking about God can do anything that men would absolutely think it's impossible. So I got this empty cup here. And let's say, okay, I want to fill this cup. And, 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 and God says, son, do you believe I could take all the water that is in this world and put it into this cup? I believe that God could do that. Come on. Can God do that? Can't God take all the water of this world and put it in this cup? Come on, y'all ain't saying yes to me. I got a bunch of doubters here this morning. Yes, he can. But now you got to ask yourself, okay, so I, I, I did a research. I thought, okay, uh, how much water is in this world? And when I got done with all my calculations, I came up approximately uh, 1,003. 100 billion quadrillion, not billion. Listen, 1,340 quadrillion tons of water in the earth. 
And how many know what a quadrillion is? It's a thousand trillion. A, thou, a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. And the top scientists of this world say, if we calculated all the weight of all the water in the world, it would be 1,340,000 quadrillion. Could God put all that into this cup? Yes, he can. Well, I've got something that's even way beyond that. The God of all creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was nothing made that was made. That Jesus who created all things that the heavens cannot hold in his, in his spirit form. He lives in you. He lives in you. That's why Jesus said this, nothing is impossible to those who believe. Well, what is it we believe? It says, for whatsoever is born of God, or born of the seed of Christ, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. The Christ. Now, the word Christ in the New Testament is used over 500 times, and it's used 60 times in the four Gospels, okay? So the word Christ, he, the, the, the Jewish people were not looking for Jesus, by the way. They were looking for the Christ. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the anointed one. And matter of fact, if you were to call yourself the Christ, they would kill you. And that's what Jesus said when he, sat, when he went to his own home synagogue. He got in there and they said they were going to let him read the scriptures as it was traditional for him. And he said this out of the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now that was scripture. Everybody knew that was the Messiah. And every synagogue had a chair that nobody sat in that was reserved for nobody but the Messiah. And Jesus sat down in that Messiah and said, I'm him. I'm the Christ. Lord, Lord. He said, I'm the Christ. I'm the one that was prophesied when God said to the woman, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. I'm the one who was prophesied when it said a virgin is going to conceive and give birth. I'm the prophesied one. And you know what? They could not accept that. They could not receive that. And that, remember now that synagogue was full of his relatives, his nephews, you know, his uncles, the men. They, he grew up in that town. The, all the men, they grabbed him. Not nice. They lifted him up, and there was a cliff right outside of that, and they went to throw him over the cliff. They said, we got to get rid of this fanatic. This, this guy has lost his mind. He says he's the Christ. Well, guess what? He is the Christ. Christ means the anointed one. Now, that's why I've never gotten caught up, and I'm going to say this in love. I've never, caught, I, I've never wanted anybody's mantle, per se. You know, they want, you know, John G. Lake's mantle. They want, you know, or Robert's mantle. They, I don't want their mantles. You know why? Because I've got the anointed one who has all power, all authority, all dominion. He lives in me. Hallelujah. So because he's in me, that means all that he has ever done, he can do it again through me. <laughs> all he's ever done Hallelujah. he'll do it again according to the will of the father you understand i'm saying according to the will of the father it says uh, w when we pray we have this confidence that whatever we ask according to his will he hears us so we can have whatever but you got to believe this so if you truly believe that Gee, now listen, let's go a little bit deeper because really the Bible says, know you not that your body is the temple of God and it's God that dwells in you. And he said, I will live in them and walk in them and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So God said, God, God, Jehovah, 
all of all of the all of the redemptive names, you know, El Shaddai, Tiskanu, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah. What? There's 13 of them. All, all of that, illustrating who God is. Guess what? Lives in you. God lives in the heart of a born again believer. And when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, now the Holy Ghost or the triunity of God moves into you. So that means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost lives in you. He lives in you. Well, I, 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 just, I just don't feel him. No, you don't understand. It's not a feeling. Kind of reminds me when I was a kid, I watched uh, Alice in Wonderland. Have you ever watched that? Or was it Alice in Wonderland? No, Dorothy in, in Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz. And there, there was a, a scarecrow, and he always said this, if I only had a brain, if I only, remember that guy, the scarecrow, if I only had, dummy, you have a brain. If you didn't have a brain, you couldn't talk, you couldn't walk, you couldn't commit. But his whole life is, if I only had a brain. And people, oh, if only God would come. He's in you. Whew. See, and we don't understand. And, and, and I, I've known this for years. And I get people all the time. I, I, for, I, honestly, I, get, I had a woman call me yesterday. She called me from Georgia. And I picked up the phone, and I said, hello. And she said, is this Mike Yeager? And I said, yeah. She said, oh, you really do answer your phone. I said, what? Well, another lady from Georgia who's a friend of mine, she was reading one of your books. She thought, well, I can, can I really get a hold of this guy? So she called you, and you prayed for her, and you answered the phone. I, 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 I. She said, I spent over a day praying about whether or not I could get a hold of you, and here you are answering the phone. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, you know, but I get to talking to this woman on the phone and, 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 and how do I help people? It, it's really because we got the cart before the horse. We're trying to get blessed when we're already blessed. We're trying to get healed when we're already healed. We're trying to get delivered when we're already delivered. How? By believing what God says in his book. It says, you have overcome them, little children. Why? You have overcome them, little children, because greater is he that is in you <laughs> than he that is in the world. So people are trying to get a greater anointing, a greater power, a greater manifestation, a greater this and a greater that. When you got all you could ever, you can't even hope and dream for. God's in you. He said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I'll be their God. God is in you. God is in you right now. Close your eyes for a moment. Lord, I pray this revelation becomes alive in the church in this dispensation. That God is already in us, Lord. That Jesus is already in us. Lord, help us to see that. In Jesus' name. When, when you begin to really see this, It'll, it'll change everything about you. Now, when I got born again, I didn't know it was literally Jesus in me, but the, the reality of God coming into my life was so overwhelming. It did change everything about me. I mean, everything. I mean, I, I mean right, with right then and there, when I had the reality, whoo, I didn't even know what born again was. I just, you know, committing suicide, fell to my knees. Never had the gospel preached to me, but as a Catholic, I knew that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was the son of God, that he was sinless, that he, he died, he took our sins and rose again from the dead. I did know that as a Catholic, no matter what you think of it. I fell to my knees, cried out to Jesus. He came rushing into my heart. I jumped up, took my three and a half packs of cigarettes. Through the, uh, a day, I took my carton of cigarettes. I didn't give them away. I threw them away. 
I took my hashish and my drugs. I put them in the toilet. I took my southern comfort and my, uh, 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 my tequila and my vodka and, 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 and I dumped it down the toilet. Uh, I, I grabbed all my filthy magazines, threw them away. I went to my record collection, which was my biggest joy, and I gathered all of my records and I trashed them. I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I began to walk, and my language was nothing but cuss words, four-letter words. I was proud of turning people to make, 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 making people blush. I remember I went home 18 years old. I came down from Alaska, had that ear operation, had to drive down to Alcan, and uh, I, I visited the high school I was going to some, and some of the girls were there, and I, I cussed into where they, because they were kind of mocking me. I had a speech impediment, but the filth that came out of my mouth, they literally blushed. I mean, I was proud of the garbage, the, the, the manure coming out of my mouth. But the moment I gave my heart to Christ, I do not know if I have cussed one time in almost 49 years. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And the reason why it was so impactful for me was because when I got born again, I had nothing to live for. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I just gave myself to Jesus, not knowing that would allow Jesus to manifest himself in me. So he's in us right now. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And, and like I said, there's so, so, so many scriptures. There's so, so many scriptures. And, and uh, Romans 8.10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead also will quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He dwells in you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost lives in you right now. And all the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ and he's in you right now. And I'm sorry to say that when you die and you wake up on the other side, you'll discover he was in you all the time. And you just didn't really know it or didn't believe it. See, we can know this. I know this here, but I don't have all of that revelation that Jesus is in me, in me. But I, I look back over my life and I, I remember times of amazing, amazing deliverances and protections and healings. And I really believe that during those times of my life, I was walking in a deeper revelation of this truth than I do a lot of times. See that? We got to have a revelation. Remember, it says there, what does it say there in Ephesians? Look there as we, before we close. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Because Paul the apostle, I mean, he's just like spilling the beans. I mean, he's just like dumping the revelation right from the very beginning, you know. And he says things that, are, that the human mind just can't comprehend. But Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. According as he has chosen us in him. Who? Those who would say, I want him. And meant it. I want him. I've got to have him. And what did say in John 17? Oh, you praise to the Father, the very last prayer before he went to the cross. Father, that they may be one with us, even as we are one. That the world may believe, that the world may know who you are. See, that, that can you imagine? If, if you ask God, God, what is your number one desire? Listen to this, that you're one with me. That is, that's his greater, greater. Now, that ought to thrill us. Oh, God wants to be one with me. I, I remember, you, you know, has there ever been anything in your life that, that, that thrilled your soul to the point to where you were so excited, you shook? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have, now, I'm not talking about something bad, negative. Have any of you ever, ever been so excited to where something is about to happen? 
You know, all of creation is up on its tippy toes, waiting into the manifestation of the sons of God, the completion of God's ultimate plan to where those who would choose to follow him would be made one with him. Oh, all of creation. Have any of you ever experienced an excitement in your life? Well, how about when you were kids? Christmas, right? Right, right, Santa Claus is coming. I, I did. I mean, I remember as a kid, my mom would, dad would put out the chunk, the milk and the cookies, homemade cookies, and, and I could barely go to sleep because the big fat man was coming down our little one foot by one foot, you know, uh, oil gas stove, you know, chimney, you know. I mean, I could hardly hold, I'm just, and you couldn't get me to go to bed. Any, any of you experienced that with your children? Or maybe, can you, some of you, some of you can remember back in those days. Has there ever been an, I'll tell you what, I remember. I remember the day, August the 19th, 1978. Was it the 18th or the 19th, baby? Huh? It was the 19th. I had proposed to Kathy. Well, the reason we get mixed up is because my birthday is the, the day we got married. Listen to this. I'm up front in this old movie theater that we had turned into a church. And the music starts and Kathy comes through the doors and she's coming with her white, beautiful gown on that her Aunt Karen helped her make. Her, her and her aunt made it. And I literally began to shake like a leaf. I was trembling. To, I don't know if you even seen it, baby doll. Because when I seen her, my heart was so overwhelmed that I'm thinking, whoa, that amazing woman is going to say yes to me today. I, mean, I thought, what in the world is wrong with her? <laughs> you know, I didn't even have a job. She had to buy the wedding bands. Well, here she comes, and I tell you what, by the time she got up front, I, I about blacked out because of the excitement in my heart that we were going to enter into this covenant. Listen, oh, my wife is wonderful, but there's no comparison to the covenant we have with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Glory. And he lives in me. In him we live and move and have our being. Jesus said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, and I'm in you, and you're in me. He's in us. It's not no exaggeration. It's no fabrication. It's not my imagination. He's in me. And there's times when he was so real in me that a woman hitting me in the face with a knife could not penetrate my skin. When two blazing fires that were consuming fires, I can take you to the spots on the property, and Jesse Hafer's outside, and he got burnt. I'm in the fire, and I feel like it's air conditioning. I mean, when the Spirit of God overwhelmed me and my sisters, 1973, Red Maverick, and the Holy Ghost took over driving that car from the afternoon into the sunset when I finally came back, and I put my hands on the steering wheel. I mean, story after story. How did that happen, Pastor Mike? Because I was walking in the reality of who, not now who I am, but who's in me. Christ in me. He's in you. And if you get that revelation, it will drive out the sickness. It will drive out the disease. It will drive out the infirmity. It will drive out the sin. It will drive, drive out of your body, out of your mind, out of your emotions, everything that is against the divine character, the divine nature, and the divine personality of God. It's the mystery that has been hidden from the ages that is now made manifest to his saints. To his saints. To those who have said, my life is Christ. And God will give you that revelation. I'm so excited because I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. I'm still kicking. I, I still have an opportunity to, to, to go from glory to glory. From a, not trying to get more of God, but God is trying to get more of me. He wants me to be obsessed with him. And when I become obsessed with Jesus, 
I'll become possessed by Jesus. <laughs> possessed by him. You were made. Your body is the temple. It's a house. It's the dwelling place. Out of all of creation, nobody else was made to be dwelt in by God. No one else. Not the angels. Not animals. Not the great whales of the ocean. We were made to be dwelt in by God. God himself dwelling in us. Mm. And you become, that's why he said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means come to harm you to the degree of the revelation that you, and what is revelation? It's faith. That's what revelation is. It's faith. It's faith. So I'm on the phone with these precious people calling me all the time. And I can't teach them. That's why I wrote all these books. I, I said, okay. And I said, I wrote these books to try to help people to understand, to grasp the reality of how it works. I said, I don't get healed when I see the healing. I'm healed in my heart before I ever see it manifested. And that's what gives me the power to push through the pain and the symptom, the blood running down my leg when I had kidney stones or uh, all the manifestations of colon cancer or a busted kneecap or a broken foot where I knew that I knew I was healed and I slammed it down five times and the fifth time it was like it was never broke. It's Christ in me. <laughs> oh, oh. Is Christ in me? And the same Jesus that Paul, Peter, James, and John had now lives in you. He's in you. And, and, and God, because God, he understands, but if God was human, he, he'd be shaking his head and say, I just don't understand. I, 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 not only did I, did I give them all that I got, but I live in them, and they still can't receive. Not demeaning you. It's the devil. It's the flesh. It's the, it's the world. We, um, we just, we need to grab that, but you got to want to know it. It's there. I mean, like I said, there's many, many scriptures. The in him scriptures, uh, uh, us in him and he is in us and, and what we have in him. Let's finish up here. It says, according as chosen us in him before the foundation world, that we should be holding without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It's for him. It says, for thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive praise and glory and honor, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. See, my heart weeps for this present generation because they haven't seen the real. See, we're called the body of Christ. Over, as a matter of fact, here as we, we look down here, um, look here in Ephesians, verse 12, that, chapter 1, that we should be to the praise of his glory, first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, I'm giving you the word of truth to, today, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, after you believed, after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Listen, this is a pattern. After you believed, you were baptized in the Holy Ghost. After you believed, the Holy Ghost was given unto you and to your children, to as many as well. After you believed, the Holy Ghost was for you, you received him. After you believe, the manifestation of your healing happens. After you believe, your prayer will be manifested. Back, Pam was here. I think Bill was. Remember that winter? We had lots of snow. We had no LP gas left. No, it was a bad winter. No LP gas. We had no money. Sunday morning, I come over here. I turn them on. You can smell the garlic. I said, okay, now, Lord, this is your church. You sent me here. And, uh, I, I, and if I could have done something else, I didn't have wood stoves. You do what you can do, okay? And then God does the rest. The little boy with the fishes and the loaves, okay? So I went out here, a 1,000-gallon tank, empty. Didn't have no money. I actually owed him money. 
I said, I laid my hands on that thing. I said, no, God, you sent me here. You said you to provide. And I said, Lord, until the money comes in, I'm going to ask you to keep ask this tank. It's on red to keep this tank producing. Now, Lord, I thank you. I went in and by faith, I turned the heaters on. They all came on. At the end of that service, I said to the congregation, I said, we're all taking a walk, about maybe 20 of us. I said, we're going outside. I'm going to show you something. And they walked out in the snow with me, and they seen the empty tank. And we all did that for the next two and a half months together, all of us. Every Sunday, I'd say, okay, I'm going to show you what God is doing. And for two and a half mon months, we heated this building with no LP in the tank. Why? Because greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And what is in, 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 in verse 19? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us? Word who? Oh, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God's at work in us. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. We're the body of Christ. We're the hands, we're the mouth, we're the voice, we're the eyes. We're the temples of God and God lives in us. Do, do you remember when the Israelites were facing a gigantic battle? And the two sons of Eli, which were rascals, they went and they took the Ark of the Covenant, it represented God's dwelling place. And when they brought it into the army of Israel, they all shouted, God's here, God's here. Now listen to this. And the Philistines, they quaked, wet their pants. They said, oh, the God that delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians and, and caused the walls of Jericho to come crashing down. And, and, and they, they bragged about God for a while. And they said, what are we going to do? We're dead men. He said, well, well, all we can do is fight. And they won the battle. Do you know why? Because the Ark of the Covenant didn't belong where they took it. God was in the Ark, but the God in the Ark the manifested glory couldn't do anything because they were out of the will of God. Why isn't God manifesting himself in the church like he did in the book of Acts? Because it is out of the will of God. It's out of the will of God. I'm not talking about blatant sin. I'm talking about what they've established, and I'm guilty, as the priority of their life. What is the priority of my life? The simple prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in me. And when I can completely, and I have at times, su submit myself to that reality, your will, not my will, God. And I can live in that place. The glory of God will be manifested in me. Getting people healed is simple when you're in that place. I don't know how many people have called me up lately because I pray for people with the phone. I never pray people with long prayers. Uh, I, and, and I, I just pray. So this woman called me up, and her and her husband found me on YouTube, began to read my books. And I didn't know that, and she had a, like a big old tumor in the back of her head. Tumor. 
She said in her heart, I'm not going to the medical people to find out what's going on. Because probably in the natural, it probably is cancer. Big old tumor in the back of her head. She said, if I could just go to hold a Pastor Mike, I'm nobody understand. Just like uh, the people who said, if I can just get the shadow in the shadow where... Were, they, they did it with Captain Coleman. If I could just get to that meeting. See, they, them, I went to a Benny Hinn. I never went to Benny Hinn Crusades. And somebody kept saying, Mary Rockwell, said, Pastor, you need to go. You need to go. You need to go. And I finally succumbed myself, okay, because I never watched TV. So I went up to Pittsburgh. Listen, I'm out there seven hours early, and there's a lineup of people. And before we ever got in, they're getting healed everywhere. I mean, the blind are seeing, the crippled. I mean, they're getting healed, waiting. And then we got into there, and they, 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 we had to sit for another five, six hours. And so they took all the, the lame and infirmed and blind and put them down on the main stadium floor in Pittsburgh, and we were up in the stands. And as I'm there, there are shouts of praises. People are getting healed everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. You know why? Because they came believing. Christ was released in that crowd. So when Benny Hinn came, he had sent somebody out to find the greatest miracles. So all those people you saw lined up to get Benny prayed for, they were already healed. They were already delivered. He just brought them up and said, you know, and I'm not picking on Benny, but it made it look like Benny prayed for him. They got healed. They did. They got healed. Because faith released the power of Christ in their midst. That's why the devil hates faith so much. It releases the reality of Christ. So I, I prayed. I prayed for this woman. Uh, I've got report after report. They even wrote up. I didn't know what was going on. I prayed for her. Well, she also, she said a month before that, I called you up in, in my, I think it was her thumb was all messed up, infected, swollen. It was so bad she couldn't hardly stand it. But it was, so I prayed for that woman with a lump in the back of her head. She said, Pastor Mike, by the next morning, that lump burst open. She said, all this ugly pus came out of me, and then it, within a matter of days, it was like it was never there. Just like that. But she believed, if Pastor Mike prays for me, her thumb got healed the same way. I get story after story. People, not members here, but people call me up, and they get healed all the time. I don't even write them all down. But you know why? Because it's not me. I'm just a contact point. That's all I am. I won't rob people from that. I don't make people think I'm the healer because I'm not the healer. Christ is the healer. But, listen, when I go out to minister in places, I just got a phone call from the head over all the Women's Glow meetings in Pennsylvania. And they said, Pastor Mike, we want you to come in October. We're having all the women leaders over the aglow coming. I said, okay. She said, you don't remember. She said, but uh, uh, back 10, 15 years ago, you, you spoke at one of our women's aglow meetings. She said, I brought my sister to that meeting. She said, you walked up to every one of us and told us prophetically what was going on in our lives. My sister at that time wasn't right with God. She said, you laid hands on her. She got born again and started speaking in tongues right then and there. Right then, laid my hands on her. She started speaking in tongues. She said it blew us away because she wasn't even asking for the Holy Ghost. But it says that a man is without honor in his own town. It's called the sin of familiarity. And because you become familiar with a person, you don't see the Jesus in them. But Jesus is in you. Say this, he's in me. He's in tonight. I want to take you through the scriptures, and I'm going to have you say after every scripture, he's in me. You ought to start saying that to yourself. Say, start, just start telling yourself, Jesus is in me. He's in me. He's in me. The Jesus who's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Jesus who overcame principalities of ours, the Jesus who created all existing things, the Jesus who said, let it be, and it was. That Jesus is in you. That Father is in you. That Holy Ghost is in you. And what releases it? Faith. Where is that going to come from? The truth. 
Jesus wasn't exaggerating when he said, all things are possible to those who believe. Believe what? Believe that he's it. He's it. It's done. It's done. It's taken care of. I learned that as a 19-year-old baby Christian when it came to healing. I don't know why I had to be gift of faith. I just busted my kneecap. Who cares? I just wrote a book. I know it will offend some people. It says, I do not need your prognosis. And it's called learning to trust in God. I do not need your prognosis. I don't need the MRIs. I don't need, and I list a whole, I looked it up. I don't know what that stuff is. I don't need your blood test, your urine test, your this test and that test. Well, pastor, what, what, what if the devil attacks you? Well, he does. What do you do? The minute he attacks me, I take authority over the pain, over the affliction, over the sickness. I tell it to go, and I just begin to rejoice in it and walk in it. And a lot of times, I don't even tell people what's going on until after the healing has been manifested, and then I'll share it. Yep, yep. Had this, had that, this happened, that happened, that happened. Yep, I, I didn't even tell you a story. One day, it was in the wintertime. I was so stupid. Don't say Pastor Mike stupid, but I was stupid. So I had to come over here and get the heat turned on. Why? I left my slippers on, right? It's ice out. How dumb can you be, right? And so on my pickup truck, I have what they call guardrails, uh, foot rails. You step on them, right? They're about this far, you know? Well, I slipped on the ice how you slip, and I slipped on the ice. My, I went down hard with my elbow in between the truck frame and that stepping board, and I broke my arm. I broke my arm that morning, Sunday morning. I broke my arm. Oh, it was broke. Oh, I grabbed it. I repented. Lord, forgive me. I should have put my work shoes on. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, God, I repent. Now it's, and I'm, I'm hanging on to it. I'm in Jesus' name. I'm saying, in Jesus' name, I command them bones to be knitted together. I command those bones to be healed. I command that bone to be made whole. I'm just speaking the word over so all that morning now. So I'm preaching and probably people direct. I'm hugging. I'm hugging my arm next to me because it's broke. But I'm not moved by it. I'm not moved by broken bones. Now, if you have been, don't don't. I'm a, my wife broke her wrist and that, I'm, I'm not I'm not attacking this stuff. I'm just saying that I know that I know that I know that I know God even heals me in spite of my stupidity. By the next morning I woke up, it was like my arm had never been broken. The next morning. As we closed, a woman called me up and from Georgia, an older lady. I think she was African American, I think she was 72. She wanted me to pray and believe God with her for something. And we started talking about healing. She said, oh, Pastor Mike, she said, I understand healing. She said, I, I got a, I forgot what they call a compound fracture. She broke her bones to where her bones stuck out. She said, I grabbed that, and I, I, and I said in my heart, I'm not going to the doctors. Jesus, you're my healer, and I thank you that I'm healed. I thank you I'm made whole. And I think she said, Pastor Mike, I went to bed with that compound fracture. I woke up in the morning. It was like I never had it. You could see no evidence of it. Jesus, glory. Why not? Sister Sandy came here. She don't come no more. Her husband, Ted, wouldn't let her come because when the epidemic was going on, he said that she, he didn't want her to kick. See, this is how the devil works. Didn't want her to catch it here, and yet she was frustrated. She said he goes to Walmart every day, Pastor Mike. But Walmart is a... A, a bacteria-free place. Everybody knows that. Yeah, no germs. No. But she came here with cancer in her thyroid. The Lord told me. I saw it by the Spirit. said, you got cancer in your thyroid. She said, yeah, yeah, they want to operate on me. I said, well, that cancer's got to go. Laid my hands on her. She went back, and they could find no cancer. Sandy came in one day with a broken arm. She had it in a soft cast, and she, she told me. She said, Pastor Mike, I... I I, I broke my arm, but I believe if you pray for me, God will heal it. I said, let's do it. I prayed for her, and right then and there, she stripped the cast off, and she said, oh, look at that. The next thing that happened to her, she broke her foot. Same thing. God healed her right then and there. 
Mary Rockwell was here one day, and, and how many know Mary Rockwell? Precious woman, she moved up and she lives in Florida now, but she had literally messed up both wrists so bad that they had to put them in cast, and she said, Pastor Mike, if you pray for my wrist, I know God will heal them. I said, let's get it done, prayed for her wrist, and she went home, she pulled the cast off, and she said, Pastor Mike, I painted all that day into the evening, and not one time did my wrist hurt me. But guess what? It's not Mike Yeager. You know who it is? It's Jesus in me. Well, give the Lord a hand clap and a shout.